a real credit to their, their various services. Um, what are your expectations from them? Well, I th I've, I, we've met, I have worked with uh, Gambian officers who've come through Sandhurst and the quality has always been high, so I didn't expect anything less once we got here. So they're first rate. And you, do you think they can perform as you day train? I think they will very well. They've got a good, good rep from Dofar, and, I'm, and if they deploy to Mali, I'm sure they'll maintain those excellent standards that they've, they've set themselves. Speaking on behalf of his fellow participants, Lieutenant Colonel Yoro Jalo reminded the gathering of the strides they have made in better understanding insurgency and counter-insurgency related problems. The five-day training brought together sister services including the members from the Gambia Armed Forces, Gambia Police Force, the Gambia Fire Services and the National Intelligence Agency. Louis Mendy, GRTS. Well, we'll be back with more stories after the break. Welcome back. Tensions continue to rise in the Egyptian capital Cairo ahead of the referendum on a draft constitution that has created deep divisions in the already destabilized country and amidst fears of an impending violence, some 250,000 soldiers and policemen were deployed to various places to maintain peace and order. Details in this CFI report. For Egyptians living abroad, voting has already begun on the constitutional referendum. The atmosphere was calm in Egyptian embassies. But within the country, things are more complicated. The voting will be carried out in two rounds, the first on the 16th of December, the second on the 22nd. There are not enough judges to monitor the voting, as many have decided to boycott. The draft constitution has seriously divided Egypt. The secular opposition argues that the text was quickly adopted by an assembly dominated by Islamists. Why have you drafted a constitution that diminishes the independence of the judiciary? Why have you drafted a constitution that does not guarantee the rights of women? Why have you drafted a constitution that forces children to work? Why have you drafted a constitution that will create a new dictator? The opposition is calling for people to vote no to put an end to the draft constitution. Of course we are going to vote no, because this constitution destroys freedom. The freedom of expression is under threat. Tomorrow we will vote no. But President Morsi's supporters defend the constitution and say it will bring stability and prosperity to Egypt. We will vote yes to advance the country. Tensions are very high in the final hours before tomorrow's voting. There were clashes in the city Alexandria between supporters and opponents of President Morsi. 250,000 soldiers and police officers have been deployed across the country to maintain order during the voting. As Japan prepares to elect a new prime minister this weekend, the nation is still struggling to, to recover from last year's earthquake and devastating tsunami. And as for residents of one small town, the pool seem a long time away. CNN's Alex Zolbat explains. Coastal areas in Ishinomaki still show the scars from the tsunami of March 2011. What was once a neighborhood is now eerily quiet. Destroyed homes, long abandoned. Mine, mine. Like everyone here, Kenichi Kurosawa remembers the day well. He was driving down this road to try to meet his wife when the waves moved in. I knew I had to get to higher ground fast, he tells me. I climbed this tree to get to safety. This is some of the video he shot in the hours that followed, perched above the destruction. Kenichi spent the entire night, more than 12 hours, sitting in the tree, in sub-zero temperatures, soaked and freezing. 
sign. Today, he brings us to the sign that he erected in the weeks that followed. It's become a memorial of sorts here in Ishinomaki. It says Gambaro Ishinomaki. What does Gambaro mean? Gambaro, you know. It means hang in there, do not give up, he tells me. I wanted to do something to encourage the people here. His message for Japan's next prime minister? I know it was a huge disaster and things would take time, but I'm frustrated, he says. The reaction has been too slow for too long. 67-year-old Katsuji Ogata lost his wife in the tsunami. He used to run a small restaurant here. Now it's a simple food truck. And he isn't afraid to say what he thinks about the government. The government hasn't done a thing for us. They've only cleared the debris, he says. They want to build a park here. But what will that do? We need homes. As you can see, there is still a great deal of work to be done. But many people here are very frustrated with the government. Billions of dollars in reconstruction money has been siphoned off to totally unrelated projects in other parts of the country. And according to the government itself, roughly 115,000 people in this prefecture alone remain in temporary housing. This is one complex. More than 500 units scattered across what are essentially parking lots, just outside Ishinomaki. The people here are getting by. They've set up a basic convenience store. And they hold a small Sunday market as well, despite the freezing temperatures. <laughs> Today, they're selling radishes. There's also a barber shop where we meet Satoshi Sakurai, who's passing time reading the paper. I'm filled with frustration, he tells us. Another prime minister, a new cabinet. The reconstruction will be delayed again. It's a sentiment shared by Junko Hino, who lost her father-in-law on March 11th, as well as her home. Today, she lives here with her husband and three children. Nothing has changed here, but the prime minister has changed many times, she says. I don't understand the meaning of any of it. Caught in the middle of a massive recovery effort and so much political change. Yes, we are working hard and trying to move forward, Kenichi says, but there are many people here who are really struggling and need some help. Alex Zolbert, CNN, Ishinomaki, Japan. The battle for Damascus still rages with the town of Dera Azul suffering the most from the heavy bombardments. As we hear in the CFR report, there are calls for an immediate ceasefire so as to evacuate, evacuate the wounded before they die. As rebel forces continue fighting around the Dera Azul airport, the town itself is still in the hands of Bashar al-Assad's forces and air raids continue on a daily basis. This major town in the east of Syria was once home to around 600,000 residents. Fighting has trapped tens of thousands of them in Deir Ezzor, and MSF says there is urgent need for medical teams to be allowed in. MSF is asking for a kind of a ceasefire, a possibility to evacuate the wounded from inside the city who are trapped inside the city, and also bring inside some medical teams who will be able to provide care to those people in need. Showing pictures of devastated hospitals, the humanitarian group draws attention to the dramatic situation in Deir Ezzor, where the health system has collapsed. The few doctors still here are quickly running out of medication, blood, and other supplies, while the number of wounded continues to rise. There are still four medical doctors inside the city providing care for, for patients, and they are uh, exhausted. They are lacking some uh, essential drugs they can use for uh, operations like antibiotics, like um, uh, morphine, like uh, painkillers. The emergency is not in a month or a week, it's today, MSF says. For many wounded patients, it's a matter of hours. If they are not evacuated, they will die. We now take our second break. We'll be right back. go a reminder of our headlines. The president, His Excellency Chef Professor Al Haji Dr. Yahya Jame, has reassigned Tenemba Jeta to the portfolio of the Ministry of Energy as Minister, whilst the Petroleum Ministry now falls under the purview of the Office of the President. 
Senegalese President Macky Sall Friday dispatched a high-powered ministerial delegation to Banjul to extend his gratitude to the president and Gabin.